Hello, everyone. Again, I was on mute. My name is Mariana Balboni. I'm the coordinator of Social Protection on our platform. I'm uh, very happy to have you all here today for the relaunch of the ISPA2 um, website that is now hosted on social protection. And we are looking forward to this collaboration so that we keep informing you uh, with the most updated you know, uh, tools and solutions for implementing and monitoring um, social protection uh, programs. Just wanted to highlight, I think uh, ISPA tools are a very important achievement. They are meant to be a living document that promotes continuous improvement through community engagement. So it's been uh, there for some years already with uh, different experiences and very important ones that we are going to see today in this in this webinar. They also represent a consensus among development experts on key aspects of social protection system analysis. So uh, important tool on this aspect too. Spatools are ideal for joint country work as they are jointly, jointly agreed upon and agency neutral. I mean, many... There was a lot of collaboration between uh, many agencies, the World Bank, ILO, which lead the, the, the ISPA tools, the ISPA tools, but also the host PFB community to reach out to, to come, come together into this, these tools. They are uh, very useful tools. Uh, they are somehow supported uh, by the team that is based in Washington, the team from the World Bank, and in Geneva by the ILO. Uh, and uh, assistance for the countries are available. Uh, the team is, is there. You're going to meet, or if you don't know already, Veronica and uh, Adia. So not uh, using much of your time for these introductions um, and making sure that we keep track of time. I'd like to introduce you to Adia, which is a, so, um, uh, the social protection economist and ISPA2 secretary, a co-lead at the World Bank of the ISPA2. Idea, sorry, because your whole name is not showing to me. Okay. Uh, idea Kriaizu. So, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mariana. Um, I hope you can see me. Um, uh, good morning. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we're very excited to be relaunching um, this big uh, partnership um, known as the ISPA tools. It will now be housed under sp.org, uh, which is um, sort of a great transition because ISPA tools are an unbranded partnership, although it is uh, the secretariat is between the World Bank and ILO. Uh, we, have, um, we have a very good mix today of, uh, of uh, tools being presented by uh, different colleagues from different organizations. And then we will continue with um, a panel discussions on these tools, and there will be time for uh, Q&A at the end as well. And just to remind everyone that this session will be uh, is recorded. Um, so if you want to share it in the future with colleagues who couldn't attend, or if you want to sort of reintroduce yourself, uh, it will be available. Just very some very brief housekeeping rules. Um, um, you can use the chat box that's available in the Zoom um, if you want to make comments, if for some reason during the Q&A I don't see your hand being raised or you would like to make an intervention that we can follow up later. Um, and you can always interact with us um, on X using the hashtag sv.org webinar. Um, this, um, this is a very uh, active community and we hope that ISPA will become um, sort of a very um, act, active um, segment of this of this big community that we have. Um, and um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Veronica, who will give us an introduction uh, of the ISPA tools, a brief one, um, and then we will continue with the uh, tools uh, presentations and and forward. Over to you, Veronica. Yes, thanks a lot, Adia. Um, so I'm Veronika Wurzak, I'm Social Protection Policy Specialist at ILO Headquarters in Geneva, and jointly with Adea, I have the pleasure of co-leading the ISPA Tools Secretariat. As Mariana already said, we are here to help you whenever you want to apply an ISPA tool, if you need any support um, to better understand um, what we're trying to do um, uh, with the ISPA tools or how to apply them, etc., um, you can always contact us. Um, so. 
I hope many of you may already know what ISPA tools are, but to give you a quick introduction, um, ISPA tools, uh, we started to develop them as a suite of tools um, that aim to help countries to improve their social protection systems. On the one hand, by analyzing strengths and weaknesses, but also by offering um, options and informing social protection policy making. Um, we have clustered the different tools uh, that have been developed um, into three buckets. Um, one set of tools is really looking at social protection systems. So the, the, the overall social protection system architecture made up of different schemes and programs um, and their financing mechanisms and their delivery mechanisms. So this is really the system bird's eye view. Um, in, in that you, you find uh, a separate tool for financing um, and for the entire system uh, assessment and for policy options assessment. The second bucket is that for social protection schemes and programs. Um, uh, and the third one is really one level further down on very particular aspects of social protection scheme and program delivery. Um, you can here see the overview of the um, ambition we had for different tools to develop in these three bu buckets. So as I already said, at the system level, there's one tool looking at the overall social protection system called core diagnostic instrument. There is another tool um, that looks at different policy options and another tool looking at social protection financing. At the program level, we have one tool that we will hear the presentation of today on that is already uh, fully published on food security and nutrition and another one published on social protection public works programs. Draft tools are available um, on cash transfers and on um, disabilities. That's the program bucket. And then for delivery systems, we have three tools that have already been published, one on social protection identification systems, one on social protection payment mechanisms, and a third one that was uh, launched quite recently under the leadership of the World Bank, looking at um, digital public infrastructure or social protection uh, and management information systems. And uh, I think that there was also a webinar when we launched that tool and uh, um, there will be a link in the chat where you can find um, that and other webinars that we've previously had on ISPA tools. Um, ISPA tools all follow the same structure. Ruslan is going to present this uh, for the Kodi tool, so I'm not going to go into much detail of this because you'll have an explanation later on, but just to say that they all um, have these uh, the same structure and, and composition. Um, what is our main target audience for these t tools? Um, I mean, overall, we can't control the use anyway. Um, they are publicly available on the website for download. Everybody can use them, but um, they are really designed as expert tools. Um, and this is because uh, they are developed as generic tools that are potentially applicable in all country contexts um, and for, for all different objectives or purposes. But that means that before you can make good use of them in a given country context text with a specific policy objective, you will need to, to tailor the tool to your needs. And this definitely requires some social protection expertise for this to, um, to do this, um, I think. But overall, the target groups, of course, are then social protection experts across the board from government institutions, but we also hope they are useful for development agencies as well as academic and research institutions. And obviously, we've seen in the past, a lot of the uses of these ISPA tools is not really a fully fledged country application for, for doing a full country analysis, but they are also used a lot just as reference tools um, for uh, any country analytical work or, um, or other research. Um, there is um, also an, um, implementation guidelines that come with uh, the ISPA tools where we suggest, I mean, they're, they're of course not prescriptive, but we suggest that um, what is important uh, in carrying out this country analytical work is not just the content of what this um, analysis uh, aims to look at from a technical perspective, but the process, how you conduct um, this analysis is equ at least equally important. 
Um, and so from the planning uh, through to the, the final dissemination of the findings, it is important first and foremost uh, to, to make sure that all important stakeholders are on board and fully informed and can contribute um, to the ISPA tool application. Um, but at the same time that you have a strong lead agency and a strong core team of people who work um, on implementing the tool. Um, this is important for uh, the overall planning. Uh, this also carries a certain cost with it in terms of time, staff, but also financial uh, resources, especially um, if you want to be participatory and organize workshops, etc. cetera. Um, so this needs to be ca carefully planned in advance. Um, um, the first step is typically to do a desk review, um, uh, to do a literature review of what data and information is already readily available um, and, and out there, and, and what are potential information or data gaps that need to be filled through expert interviews um, or uh, through um, additional uh, data collect collection, although uh, normally um, there's no primary data collection foreseen. If there is, uh, if certain data is not available, that's also a finding that will be recorded in the ISPA tools, but um, this is, there's no primary data collection foreseen um, in the scope of an ISPA tool application. Um, um, following the data collection, uh, there's normally a, a step of then carrying out the analysis. Um, and then drafting and presenting a draft country report, um, usually also through a workshop together with the draft assessment, then carrying out final revisions and then disseminating the, fin uh, the, the findings. All of these steps are of course explained in more detail in the implementation guidelines that I mentioned. Um, and with this, um, I invite you to explore further the tools that are available, the implementation guidelines, um, and also past applications. We do have country um, ISPA tool application country reports uh, on our website. Um, so we hope uh, that with the new host of socialprotection.org, where we have um, everything in one place now, uh, this will uh, generate good access and knowledge sharing on ISPA tools and on ISPA tool applications. Thank you, Veronica. Um, that was a very uh, useful introduction to the ISPA tools. And of course, if there's more questions, we will be available um, at the question and, and answer section, but also afterwards. So please feel free to reach out to us or to the SV.org team. Um, and we can keep this community active and more updated uh, going forward. Uh, I would like to hand over to Ruslan, who will be uh, presenting the Kodi tool which as Veronica mentioned, is the tool that deals with the system as a whole. Um, and then we will continue with, um, with a, a different tool presentation that's more specific on food uh, security and nutrition. Uh, over to you, Ruslan. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Adea, and thank you, Veronica, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you uh, and to talk about these tools. Um, I believe it's it's very important uh, part of uh, the uh, interagency work uh, that uh, aims at uh, bringing together and harmonizing uh, different approaches to help countries to build their uh, social protection systems and programs and improve their delivery. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm also very honored to talk about uh, core diagnostic instrument because I was among those who uh, were involved as part of the team, interagency team, from the very start, including in piloting it and then in finalizing the, the, uh, the tool. So uh, and uh, I was uh, thinking a lot about uh, how to uh, move this work forward, uh, being involved also in the development of the cash transfer tools. Uh, so I'm going to talk about CODI today because that is where we have a lot of uh, experience and a lot of uh, interesting results. And so, and also I'm going to introduce uh, what this tool is. So my, uh, my conversation will be mostly about the, uh, very shortly about the origin and development, just to give you an idea where this tool is coming from. 
um, and what it represents. I'm going to talk briefly about modules uh, of Kodi, but also emphasize one part of Kodi application, which is the learning and knowledge exchange. And then uh, I'm going to review how the tool was implemented and what lessons have we learned and where we see the tool going in the future. And I'm going to pose some questions for discussion because that's important for us to get the uh, conversation going around those. So what is core diagnostic instrument? It was um, first proposed as part of the new uh, initiative uh, that was uh, launched by Social Protection Interagency Cooperation Board. It still exists, it works. It's a great uh, instrument for us to actually come up with a big vision of where the social protection globally is going and uh, what countries need uh, in terms of uh, building these systems. Um, it was judged from the very beginning that it's very important before we start working with a particular country to understand how what is currently done, what is understood by social protection in that particular country, how the policymakers themselves see it's going forward and how we can inform this debate and the dialogue in a systematic and coordinated way. So uh, it started, the work started more than 10 years ago. It took about a couple of years to uh, develop the tool and to test it and to finalize it. And so we can talk that, uh, um, we, we can say that in about last nine or eight years, uh, we were actually testing those tools in different places or applying them in the, the country dialogue in very different contexts, in very different countries. Um, and I hope we are now in the process of uh, learning the lessons from it. 2020 was a very important year where all of the tools uh, in ASPA were assessed, and it was a very well done systematic assessment, including Kodi, but also other tools. And we can also see what we can do as a follow up to this assessment and how we can implement its recommendations. Um, so, what are the features of Kodi? Kodi is, a, a, as Veronica said, is publicly available on the web, anybody can download it. Um, and uh, start applying it. It has a variety of uh, instruments. Um, its aim is to look at the system as a whole. And uh, looking at the SP system as a whole is actually pretty uh, ambitious exercise because typically uh, social protection systems are pretty diverse. We even say fragmented. Uh, they may not have a single authority or a single ministry that is running the whole system. So we are talking about very complex interagency inside the country, interagency dialogue and assessment. Um, the objective for it is to look at the system as a whole, understand how it performs uh, against the criteria. What are those criteria? Those uh, criteria are the desirable properties that we all, all want the system to deliver on. And the whole point of this criteria is that they are not the same. They are not overlapping. They are different properties that everybody wants to achieve, but it's really hard to achieve them all at once. So there is intrinsically a sort of a trade-off or a sort of a configuration that the countries are aiming uh, to get. Uh, and those 10 criteria that were very carefully selected in Kodi by, in the, by this interagency group that was developing it um, do reflect really those properties. We want the systems to be inclusive. We want them to be sustainable over the long term. We want them not to uh, distort incentives for people to work and to participate in the society. On the contrary, we want the, them to bring cohesion. We want them to be responsive. Uh, we want them to be adequate and um, appropriate, reflecting the political economy, the, the cultural aspects of the country, the history of the country, but also adequate in a sense that they should provide uh, assistance to those who need them at the time when they need it. Um, we uh, uh, 
developing CODI, we actually came up with the taxonomy of the key areas uh, which are common to all social protection programs. And we all know the importance of policy. So uh, part of the tool is discussing policy. Part of the tool is describing and analyzing programs. And uh, part of the tool is looking at the implementation of these different programs. Uh, the, the point of CODI is that it has to be done in a participatory way. Uh, that's the core principle of it. Uh, it's it's a dialogue, and the whole point of having the dialogue is to come up with the same way to talk about social protection, same way to look at the challenges and the achievements, and come up with some options for uh, developing it further. Um, so I already talked about these uh, features, um, and uh, I think uh, it's it's important that uh, to emphasize here uh, that in addition to the uh, this participatory tool that brings together uh, a consultative process, etc. It's also important to understand that those CODI tools are flexible and they need to be adapted to each particular context. It's not uh, a one thing, uh, a one package that is uh, rigid and that has to be done in a certain way. Uh, there is always a process of creative thinking while the teams are going uh, to apply the tool, and when the governments are requesting uh, this tool to be applied, they're actually looking for some more specific answers rather than overall uh, um, dialogue and assessment. Um, so as uh, Veronica mentioned, uh, the, uh, the CODI follows the same structure as all of the tools. It has what matters guidance, and it takes a lot of effort to uh, write this what matters. It's basically a description of what are the good practices. It's also an excellent review of the literature typically. So you have uh, snapshots of the key academic uh, research on, on that particular issue. In that case, it's a social protection. Uh, you also have uh, positions of different institutions of different organizations, international agencies, which is very useful because sometimes we work on a particular uh, set of uh, constraints, we work for a particular organization, we may not be aware how others are thinking about the same issues. So it's very helpful to actually have those things laid out so that we can discuss a proper uh, language. Data collection, as Veronica mentioned, is not meant to be uh, a primary data collection, so we are not doing the surveys or we are not doing a public expenditure review for the social protection. We are using available data. But because it's a system, uh, the information as the system is dispersed or fragmented, the information is also very fragmented. So it's it's, it's an effort just to collect of what is there and to bring it together and organize it in a consistent framework. Um, there is an uh, assessment done, which is a lot of fun. It's done in a participatory way where basically uh, key stakeholders are sitting together with us and discussing criteria by criteria with specific questions where they think their system is fitting. It's, uh, not a name in itself to do a rating. That is not the point. The point is to discuss where the country, the policymakers see themselves going, what they see as something they can improve and how and what are the criteria that they really achieve this result in improving this. And then it's all written up in the country report. Um, we want all the country reports to be published. But as I mentioned, this is a highly participatory exercise and these things can be published typically when we have a permission from the government. And very often we have sensitive topics or the government is uh, are not sure whether the publication of this document will be uh, well received. So it's a complex process to ascertain that uh, we do have uh, these reports to be disseminated or at least a snapshot. This is something that we probably need to follow up on, uh, better monitor the applications, making sure that the country reports have different level of dissemination policies so that we can actually open it up to as many people as possible. 
uh, to uh, do all of this. There are implementation guidelines, which are pretty standard across the tools, and that are emphasizing how we exactly we're approaching it, what kind of uh, discussions we need to have, how long it's going to take, uh, when uh, we can ascertain there is a demand for the application of the tool, etc. It's pretty useful, but it is very operational. It's geared towards teams that are actually doing it. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we managed to come up with this taxonomy of breaking the whole world of social protection into the three areas, policy, design, and implementation. And within each of the areas, there are specific sub-areas, sub uh, a total of 18 in the case of Cody. Uh, that was considered to be important at this time to emphasize all of them. But it looks like if you are describing the system and if you are looking at all of these different 18 areas, it's becoming a very ambitious exercise in terms of documenting what are the different schemes that exist in the country. And those schemes are in social security. Those schemes are in protection of labor. Those schemes are in social assistance. Those schemes are in social services. Uh, these are very different areas with a very different process of delivery. So it's becoming really ambitious and complex to actually capture all of this richness of information. So therefore, each time the tool is applied, there is a lot of tailoring that is going on and a lot of choices. So it's not a mechanical exercise. It's very creative exercise where selectivity and discretion is really important. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned, it's really important that ISPA is supported by the whole program of training, capacity building, uh, awareness raising, dissemination, and South-South uh, learning. Uh, it's really fun and interesting to see when countries are interacting with each other and sharing their lessons from applying those tools. Um, and uh, the and there was really a formidable effort, and I'm super happy that we are reviving it because it's important to have this interagency dialogue going with our counterparts in the governments. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, there is always uh, a flexibility. Uh, it's already uh, sort of officially full version of Kodi, but there are also light versions of Kodi that were applied. And so there is a lot of uh, lessons learned uh, from these experiments. Uh, there were a total of 18, if I'm not mistaken, uh, applications uh, done or ongoing around the world in very different countries. Um, some of them really are um, uh, available on the, on, on the website. Uh, that Veronica mentioned, and I also have a link on my presentation so you can see what is available. But more is going on. And sometimes, as Veronica mentioned, these tools are publicly available. Anybody can use them. So sometimes we just don't know uh, what is happening. So one of the things that we do want to uh, make sure is that at least there is an information when the tool is applied and some lessons and the results are shared. And so we can discuss what we learned from each application and how to improve the tool further. Um, as I mentioned already, in 2020, there was uh, a review with a set of recommendations. And I think those recommendations are very, uh, are very important for us to carry forward. So I believe ESPI is all living documents. They all need to be revisited because the practice itself is keep on developing. And uh, very recently, there was a major uh, uh, impact on social protection system and a major uh, response to the shocks and crisis that the world has experienced. We learned a lot. So it's important to bring those lessons in. Uh, the, may, the main focus of those revisions and the development of this tool has to make it more user friendly. Uh, and making it more user friendly also means trying to uh, get uh, as much uh, automation and use of technology as possible to make the, uh, this uh, compiling or curation of information uh, as efficient as possible. Um, we also think about improving communication, and this webinar is indeed part of this strategy, uh, but we also, each agency, and I take it very seriously, should uh, make effort or 
people who are part of this community should make effort to disseminate this tool inside their agency and just make people aware and excited that this exists and it opens us a door for uh, us working together, which is a lot of fun. Um, and here are the questions that I uh, formulated based on the um, on 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 this discussion. And as Veronica mentioned, all we want to see is is there a demand for having this tool bringing together different development partners and uh, making sure that we are talking about the same uh, language and we have the consistent set of advice. Uh, to the government and also coordinate our support, our practical support. So how we actually uh, get the demand? Very often we rely on different uh, uh, colleagues who are working in different agencies to flag the demand. But uh, what is the better, more systematic way to assess the demand for applying assessment? Assessment for different parts of social protection, but also system-wide assessment. What is the right time? How we find those windows where it can be useful? Uh, what are the uh, how we can incorporate the recent experiences, as I mentioned, into the design of the tools, into questions, into the rating criteria, etc. How to make a simplific simplification in a more systematic way? As I mentioned already, there is an effort each time the tool is applied to tailor it and to actually make it simpler and feasible. But how we can systematize those efforts so that we reduce the amount of information that we collect. We collect only what is needed to help the dialogue going. We don't do uh, any redundant information collection. Um, that is... Uh, lengthy that is time consuming it consumes resources so we need to streamline and we make to make those tools as efficient as possible and uh as we are going to discuss different tools it's also very important and interesting question is are we combining different tools in the same country uh what is the proper sequence are we looking at the policy options first then we are looking at the system or we're combining those and how we identify the particular parts of the system that need further analysis. That is a kind of a mega tool, or if you want a meta tool, if you want, that we, we, we may need or some kind of a guidance for those who are interested in uh, doing a systematic review of the systems. And uh, I hope we will continue with training and dissemination. It's going to be poor, but as I mentioned, it rely a lot on us just talking about it, uh, informing our colleagues, and making sure we're active members of the community, as Adair mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, looking forward for our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ruslan. Um, uh, that was a very uh, insightful presentation with lots of um, questions to think about as we as we um, continue our work on, on the ISPA partnership. Um, again, I'll remind the participants that um, you can pose questions on the chat and we will we will use them for the Q&A session or we can respond directly as the presentations are ongoing. Um, I will give the floor over to um, uh, to our colleague who will be talking about the food security and nutrition tool. Um, so over to you, uh, Rodrigo. Thank you, Adia, and thank you, Veronica and Ruslan, for, for such a, a great presentations. Um, let me uh, start by uh, uh, saying good afternoon to everyone and good morning or evening in case that you're joining from different regions. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, to the Secretariat of the ISPA tools and also for uh, the socialprotection.org for hosting this event. I think it's a very timely event uh, just to share, uh, not, not only to relaunch the tools, but also to share uh, the ongoing work or even uh, some outcomes of, that uh, we have had in the, in the, in the last few uh, years. Uh, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna talk to you about the interagency social protection assessment tool dedicated to food security and nutrition, the ISPA FSN tool. The ISPA um, FSM tool is 
among the family of program level tools or, or, or the program bucket that is, is, uh, as Veronica mentioned. In particular, this tool is focuses on the performance of the social uh, of social assistance programs. It's, that is the, 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 the let's say the, the main focus of this tool. And in order to follow or to present this tool, I'm gonna follow the, the following structure. Uh, I'm gonna to present a quick overview of the motivation and 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 the structure of the of the ISPA tool, as well as the their objectives, the diagno diagnostic criteria that are very similar to what Roslan mentioned before. Uh, I'm gonna share a few insights of the application process. Uh, and finally, I'm gonna share some lessons learned and resources at the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, as you may know, uh, evidence in general supports that social protection is an effective uh, policy instrument that contributes to poverty reduction and improved food security and nutrition. Um, for instance, uh, social assistance programs can increase the overall availability of resources at the household level and consequently impact positively uh, household food security. These resources can be used either by, uh, to purchase uh, more quantity or better quality of food or to invest in food production or productive assets to improve further household food security and dietary diversity. However, Evidence also is very clear that many factors such as program design and context can have can moderate this in, the impact of these programs. Some examples that uh, prevent the, the transmission of, 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 the, of the effects are complete is for instance, for food prices or economic shocks. Uh, and therefore this tool in particular, it um, comes uh, or it becomes relevant in this context because the ISPA FSN tool provides a framework of analysis to assess how social assistance programs can achieve a greater, a greater positive impact on food security and nutrition. It helps to identify the program design elements that help or if modified could help to improve food security and nutrition. First of all, it's important, I already mentioned it, the, the focus of the analysis of social of these tool is social assistance programs that covers uh, conditional and unconditional cash transfers, income transfers, school feeding, public works, free waivers. And in, under some circumstances, we also include uh, agricultural subsidies as I'm, I'm gonna uh, uh, speak later on in this presentation. The second analysis, the second as aspect <clears throat> that I would like to highlight of the ISPA tool is that, is that the analysis is done by assessing the contribution of social protection, social assistance programs to each of the food uh, security dimensions. In terms of availability, social assistance can improve the availability of nutritious foods by increasing the investment in agricultural production of nutritious food at the local level or by directly providing food in-kind transfer, for instance, school feeding programs. In terms of access, the social interventions can improve access to nutritious food directly by providing cash that can be used to purchase uh, nutrient-rich food, for instance. Uh, in terms of uh, food, the, the, the dimension of stability, these programs can contribute by preventing vulnerable population from falling below the poverty line in terms of shocks or crisis. And finally, in terms of utilization, um, uh, um, uh, let's say that it covers those aspects that, um, such as uh, uh, nutrition education or behavioral change communication that can also modify care practices, food consumption practices and feeding patterns to meet dietary um, uh, needs. So the object, the overall objective of, of the tool it's, is, is to help governments and agencies to assess the effectiveness of a program or a set of programs in addressing food security and malnutrition. The tool provides a, a structured framework to analyze the links between social protection and food, food security and nutrition outcomes. In particular, they said, 
it includes seven key areas to guide the detailed data collection. Um, these areas are presented here, and essentially they try to respond to uh, one broad uh, question or many questions, as you can see in the in the in the in the guidance note. But essentially, here I present a few of them. Uh, for instance, in in terms of the the area of programs, objectives, and indicators, are the food security and nutrition objectives clear, clearly defined? Are there any specific actions in terms of inclusiveness? Are the most vulnerable populations targeted somehow? In terms of adequacy, uh, we try to respond. What are the benefits? Uh, are the benefits sufficient for good nutrition, or is it too low, or is it too or is not is not enough to meet the uh, dietary um, um, uh, requirements? It, is the is the program flexible enough to adapt to changing needs, especially in times of crisis? In terms of coherence, how well the program is integrated with other sectors, and for instance, with agriculture, education, and health sectors. In terms of sustainability, how does this address some aspects in terms of uh, environmental, social, economic, financial sustainability? And finally, does the program follow uh, a right-based approach in, the, in which it um, considers the universality of the, of the right to food, or in particular, the right to adequate food? So this is essentially what the, the, the seven key areas that uh, the, the, the tool addresses. And for that, it includes essentially four uh, phases uh, of implementation. Um, you will see that uh, it, this is very similar to what uh, Ruslan presented already, so I'm not gonna go like in deep in too much into the detail, but essentially it's uh, the preparation established the assay assessment, <clears throat> assessment team, which is fundamental piece in the overall process because it brings together uh, the main stakeholders, including other sectors that might be interested in in in, in um, articulate with a, a specific social protection um, intervention. The second the second phase is about data collection. Um, again, <clears throat> it is uh, includes text reviews and some other research uh, interviews to key uh, stakeholders, and then the final two uh, phases include the the presentation of the results and the and a, a first assessment and also um, a workshop of multi-stakeholders that essentially validate the, the results um, in a, at the country level or subnational level depending on how, in which context the tool was implemented uh, in, now let me pass very quickly to, to some examples of where the, 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 the tool has been applied. In, the, in, in terms of Cambodia, um, the tool was um, implemented to assess the homegrown school feeding program. This assessment was conducted uh, with the Council for Agriculture and Rural Development uh, of Cambodia, along with FAO and GIZ. And, and after the assessment, what the government um, decided was that the homegrown school feeding framework was the, the, or was recognized as the program that was preferred as a model for school feeding in the country. As well, uh, they, uh, the, the implementation helped them to understand the needs to allocate additional resources in times of, in times of, uh, of crisis and, and, um, and, 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 and and crisis and, and shocks. In terms of uh, Palestine, uh, they, there were two programs um, that were analyzed. These programs essentially uh, helped the, 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 the um, authorities to, um, to integrate into the national food system, food, food, uh, food security and nutrition plans it helped to include some criteria to, uh, to, to, for monitoring a, an evaluation and also try to, or the intention to coordinate a series of uh, a, a, a 
or create a body of coordination among the different sectors. In the case of Paraguay, uh, it was implemented in the flagship uh, cash transfer program, Tecopora, and, and, and the tool, the implementation of the tool helped the social protection um, sector to recognize the importance of food security and nutrition, and therefore they approved to include many indicators and criteria and investment uh, in their plans, national plans for food security and nutrition. In Malawi, the uh, the uh, the assessment was uh, on the Malawi National so Social Social Support Program, and the assessment helped to introduce several or recognize uh, a few a few things that could uh, strengthen nutrition, um, uh, such as uh, social behavior change nutrition social behavior change communication and nutrition education. Finally, uh, we, this is an ongoing process and that is about to conclude in, in Zambia. We are working with the food security pack um, to, to, to assess this cash, cash plus program that provides um, the, the vulnerable groups, uh, particular farmers with uh, some, some agricultural inputs and, and livelihood its skills. Uh, again, uh, the, the implementation helped to identify some gaps in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, introducing nutritional rich crops, in, in terms of integration of nutrition education in, within the program, etc. Finally, let me just take a, um, a few, a few, just one or two minutes more, just to uh, reflect on the lessons learned. And here, I would like to mention that the ISPA tool has been uh, an, an effective tool uh, to redesign uh, social assistance programs by making them more sensitive to food security and nutrition. This is, this is, um, this is one of the interesting things or outcomes that we, we have uh, noticed. Um, the, another thing is that the tool can be easily adapted and be implemented in different contexts. That, that means that it can be implemented at national or national level. It can be uh, implemented in a set of programs. It can be implemented by different, different stakeholders together or uh, essentially by a single uh, stakeholder. The implementation process is an opportunity also to engage sectors and actors relevant to food security and nutrition. This is also very relevant because that leads to the next point, which is the government ownership increases the chances of a successful implementation. And that means that, of course, the tool provides some insights, but the, um, the implementation of redesigning uh, uh, social assistance program is a, is a task that corresponds more to the, to the national authorities. But, the, but this type of exercise already provides a very rich uh, set of information. Finally, uh, the tool is available in the website in English, French, and Spanish, and soon will be uh, uploaded the Arabic and Russian version. And, uh, and the last thing is um, FAO in 2022 um, developed a lean learning course, essentially divided the, the, the tool into, or the guidance note into one with a series of uh, concepts uh, that links social protection and food security and nutrition. And the other one with uh, the implementation of the tool itself with a, an, um, a, 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 a hypothetical uh, example. Uh, the e-learning the e course is available in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, and, and you can download it from the e-learning academy in, in FEO. Uh, that would be all, and thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the discussions. Um, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Uh, that was, again, a very insightful take on, on the tool, and I hope uh, that this will incentivize um, all of the participants to, to give it a look, especially in light of the food security uh, challenges we are facing uh, globally. Um, I would like to hand over to our colleague uh, Florian to give us um, the social, uh, the civil society view um, on the tools. Um, and over to you, uh, Florian. I think my camera is frozen, but I'm still right. talking.
<laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Adea. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Florian Jungstrand. I'm the Social Protection Advisor for WIGO, which is an organization uh, focusing on the rights of informal workers, but I'm mainly here as a representative of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors, which is a, a network of about 100 civil society organizations and workers' organizations from around the world um, that are committed to universal social protection. Um, and yeah, I've been asked to share some reflections on the role of civil society um, in, in, in the ISPA tools, application and design. And I, I have some thoughts on that, uh, but I think Ruslan um, summarized it quite well earlier when he said it all has to be done in a participatory way. I think that's the, that's the entire point of what I'm gonna say, um, but I'll say a little bit more on it nonetheless. Um, so why is it important for civil society to be involved? Um, so on the one hand, I think civil society oftentimes knows where the real issues are and the real challenges with the social protection systems. Um, they can give you, I think, oftentimes a more honest assessment um, than governments or uh, development partners might. Um, if you're working only with governments and with kind of official um, UN and other development partners, you're gonna get maybe a little bit more the, the official story. Um, whereas I think uh, civil society organizations um, sometimes have the ability to speak a little bit more freely and of course also have their own experiences. Um, so for instance, my organization, um, we go working with informal workers, they will give you a very detailed and very specific and concrete explanation of why, for instance, uh, they're excluded from social insurance schemes, uh, why they're not accessible, affordable, uh, in line with their needs, um, and why they might be at the same time excluded from poverty targeted social, prote social protection. So I think civil society organizations can give some some frank and at times maybe uncomfortable, but I think very necessary feedback um, that you are unlikely to get from other sources. Um, but of course, the very nature of civil society as representing particular groups, I think is also really helpful, right? So different groups, different civil society organizations may represent uh, you know, particularly vulnerable groups um, or groups that may require special attention. Um, so let's persons with disabilities, um, older persons, informal workers, um, women and children and uh, other potentially marginalized groups. And, you know, on the one hand, of course, civil society organizations can, can amplify those, um, um, can provide kind of best practices, uh, highlight challenges and really speak to those needs. But I think beyond a kind of technical input, you know, I think it's also in line with um, human rights principles, with the SDGs to, to, to center affected population and vulnerable groups in these policy making processes and, you know, respect their agency and their voice in this. So, you know, letting, um, you know, affected populations and, uh, you know, particular various segments of society, um, it, it, providing an opportunity to share their issues and speak to their experiences is, I think, a, a, a central um, yeah, central pillar of, of, of good practices in policymaking and certainly, um, you know, since we're following um, human rights and uh, sustainable development goals and all that. Um, so I think that's really important. But I think also maybe more pragmatically um, involving civil society in uh, the development of shared assessment, um, the development of particularly of policy options. I think it's, it's not just the right thing to do, um, but I think it's also necessary in order for the assessment and the recommendations coming out of um, all this activity to have any any weight in in society to ensure uh, societal political buy in. Um, um, I think it's it's important to to consult widely and to you know make sure that these are not just kind of cooked up between a couple of um, agencies and organizations, but reflect a a wider societal consensus. Um, and I think that's particularly important if reforms or efforts are, are asking for anything, you know, um, when we're talking maybe about contributory schemes, um, if those if those reforms or if, um, you know, if, if they're not based on an inclusive social dialogue and a, a consensus on why that's needed and why it's the right thing to do and why the pathways are appropriate ones, it's gonna be quite difficult to, to, yeah, to gain any tractions with those. Um, I think similarly, you know, as social protection systems become more integrated, um, more multi-sectoral, where we require both government and non-government actors to 
to work together, you know, that that needs to be based on um on, yeah, on a on on a shared agreement that it's the right thing to do. Um so I think that's that's another reason to bring in civil society and workers organizations um into these processes because if they don't share the assessment and if they don't if we don't collectively arrive at similar or the same kind of policy options, then there will be resistance potentially against those, or at least, you know, they'll be kind of ignored. So I think um so those are a couple of good reasons, but of course, as we know, there's there's engagement. You know, there's a there's a ladder of of consultations. Um, you know, some more um, meaningful and serious, and some more maybe perfunctory. Um, so I think what's what's really crucial is that we have meaningful engagement um, that starts. Um, you know, at the beginning of the the planning process. Um, that continues throughout the assessment, uh, the development of the kind of the analytical framework, the analysis, um, and most importantly, of course, the development of policy options. Um, and I think that's going to be much more meaningful than a kind of one-off consultation, you know, rubber stamping, which, you know, it's maybe nice, but not particularly relevant. Um, so I think that's important, but I think as it's been mentioned before, that's also going to, that's, that does, you know, that, that's not going to be cost free, right? So if you're if you're serious about it, if you're serious about meaningful engagement of civil society, you know there might be costs uh, related to that, uh, and they could be around supporting various organizations to participate. Um, maybe it's needed to um, to invest in the capacity development of particular organizations so they can really genuinely share their their priorities and you know understand the terrain in which they're operating. So, you know, if you, if you want to do it well, you have to think about it, you know, carefully and it's not something you can do kind of on, on the cheap. Um, so, to, and just finally, um, how do you, how do you go about identifying suitable um, civil society organizations? So I think one good starting point could be to see whether the country you're operating in has a national social protection platform. Um, they exist in a number of countries. Um, if that if those don't exist, they are oftentimes regional platforms that can help you. So there's the the Africa Social Protection Platform, there's the Asia Roundtable of Social Protection. Um, so they can help you maybe um, identify organizations at the country level. Um, and an, an additional pathway, if you're uh, planning a, a ISPA application in a country, but you're unsure which civil society organization to reach out to. You can also get in touch with us at the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors. As I said, we have over 100 members throughout the world, uh, various regional and national platforms, and maybe we're able to point you in the, in the right direction. Um, so you do reach out if, um, if you're uncertain about what organizations to involve. And I can put the link to the Global Coalition in the chat in a minute. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florian, for that um, take on, on the tools. Um, we'll now go over to um, our colleague from UNICEF, Céline, to give us uh, the UNICEF's take on the tool applications. Um, over to you, Céline. Thank you so much, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here <clears throat> today with you. I think UNICEF has been involved, uh, as Raslan uh, mentioned, since the beginning in the development of um, the tools, but most importantly uh, in its application uh, at country level. And it's been a very a critical resource in order to enhance social protection system for, for children and families. I saw a question earlier in the chat about it seems that nothing or not a lot um, has happened since uh, 2019. Of course, we know uh, what happened then uh, with COVID, but just as mentioned by my colleague Veronica, I think it's a series of tools that are available um, online and, and can be downloaded. And just to confirm that since then, um, Quite a lot of applications have been uh, have been done in countries. I just wanted to maybe highlight a few. I understand that in Europe and Central Asia, Tajikistan is actually finalizing um, the Kodi exercise. Kyrgyzstan did one last year. There was also, as mentioned by Raslan, Armenia, Montenegro, and Uzbekistan that did it in the 
in the past five years um, in uh, the Eastern Caribbean, one was done and actually ended up very to be very useful in Barbados uh, as, uh, as COVID came and ended up being a very critical resources to plan uh, the social protection response uh, to COVID and ensure, uh, for instance, uh, that the missing middle that we have heard a lot as we were responding to the pandemic uh, could actually receive uh, receive support. There is also uh, a process and an, an exercise starting it in St. Kitts and Nevis, just to mention a few other ones. Uh, Guatemala has also done um, a CODI exercise in 2019, uh, and more has been happening in Mozambique, Tanzania, as well as Malawi. In terms of uh, the use, um, the use of these tools, uh, especially the CODI tool, just to reflect on UNICEF leadership in its application or participation in um, at country level, maybe to reiterate a few points that have been uh, highlighted by my colleagues before. Um, I think it's it's a very uh, well. It is not a one size fits all, and something you you take and apply as it is um, in country. It's a very useful framework and allows you actually. Raslan was talking earlier about the time taken in order to develop this framework, and I think the time taken. And I think Raslan, you you mentioned fun. I'm not sure if it was always fun, but uh, the time that was spent to develop carefully the framework is actually time gains for um, at country level. I think um, Veronica was, uh, was mentioning in the chat that if we take, for instance, the CODI, you have a set of 600 questions and it's a very good start for countries to, to start tailoring what they need. Um, I think it's important we have seen to kind of know what you are, you, why you are using this tool for. And I'll, I'll mention again the example of Guatemala that has been using it with the objective to develop their social protection strategy. And I think the focus that and the tailorization to the tool that they have made has been done with this uh, objective in mind. Um, the process being as important as the product itself, I think has been uh, highlighted quite a lot by my colleagues. And But I just would like to reiterate this crucial point, not only with, um, um, with the CSOs as just mentioned by Florian, but also the importance of putting the government in the driver's seat. And as we discussed previously, this means involving the different ministries, relevant ministries and institutions to ensure you are looking at um, at the different aspects. Maybe another point that <coughs> I would like to highlight, um, someone I think in the chat or in the questions was talking about the issue at country level is that we want, and there is a rush to focus on implementation um, and not taking the time to produce the evidence and to allow for evidence-based policy making. Again, I think that there is, of course, um, work to be done, but advocacy can be made using these PAT tools to just because they present reliable uh, and technically sound evidence, which is really crucial for informed policy making. And I think that it doesn't mean delaying but by, by a lot of time uh, implementation, but again, the level of tailorization um, that can be made uh, to at least provide this crucial information before um, starting implementation. Um, maybe two additional points. The, the first one um, is what a, a crucial aspect is that these tools, especially the, the CODI will um, really allow to have an impact uh, on vulnerable population by highlighting coverage gaps. Um, 
uh, and support the prioritization um, the in terms of expansion or in terms of dealing with the the fragmentation of social protection system, for instance, that Raslan um, mentioned earlier, uh, which is a useful uh, a useful framework rather than going at uh, looking at it in um in parallel ways. Finally, maybe uh, to reflect and to start answering uh, some of the questions that Raslan had been putting, I think the big value and the, the value of this webinar um, today is really to, to get us back together. Again, we see that the, the tools are useful because they have, they have continued uh, to be used for a wide range uh, of issue and to support a wide range of uh, discussions, whether it is to improve the policy level, work at program, program level, or uh, improve the delivery or all at the same time. But I think that there is a lot of value in coming together as countries who have been using these tools to learn from each other's experience and to learn how we've been dealing with several issues or we've been using these PAD tools to advance uh, specific to uh, topics at a global level. So I think that was mentioned earlier about discussions that happen uh, a few years uh, prior to COVID, but I think it would be a good way to kind of continue facilitating these discussions in, in different ways to continue learning and continue having these uh, ISPA tools supporting um, the strengthening and expansion of social protection systems at country level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celine, for this um, update and this take on, on, on the usefulness of the tools, which actually links quite well to uh, the next segment uh, that we have foreseen. Uh, I'm mindful that we are running a bit late, um, and um, but that's a good problem in itself because it means there's so much to discuss and there's so much interest on the tools. Um, so that, you know, maybe the next webinar we do, we, we make it even longer or we split it into different webinars. Um, this was, as we mentioned, sort of to kick off this new relaunch uh, and uh, based on the demand from, uh, from practitioners and the um, sort of the, the back and forth that you have with us, we will uh, certainly be uh, willing to schedule, you know, uh, sessions on specific tools or on a specific um, sort of question that, that will arise from these discussions. So um, uh, it would be it would be great if you turn your cameras back on uh, for the panel. Uh, can I see everyone? I think only uh, Rustan is missing. Um, and um, I would like to proceed with the panel. We have about twenty minutes left, I believe, in the entire um, uh, session. If I'm not wrong, Mariana. So maybe we can do ten minutes on the panel and um, hopefully ten minutes for any last minute. Um, Q and A's is that okay, uh, Veronica? Okay, so we can proceed. So, um, thank you again to our to our panelists. Um, uh, we we would like to you know not um, make it very uh, formal the panel. Uh, so we we're happy to sort of um, go with with um, um, where the discussion was leading us and how how you think this would be m most useful for for everyone in attendance. Um, so maybe we can kick off with, you know, in addition to the tools that we've discussed and the tools that are sort of forthcoming, including the cash transfer tool that that uh, Rusan has mentioned, based on your work and and the demand from the client governments and the partners, um, are there other analytical tools that are needed, for, let's say, um, for the system or specific segments of the system going forward? Um, what what do you think? What is what is your take on it? We can start with Celine. Yeah. No, thanks so much. Um, I think that Raslan started the discussion a bit by mentioning, is it about creating new tools or is it about just adapting the existing one to kind of 
uh, fit um, and make sure they're adapted to address several emerging challenges and opportunity in strengthening social protection system. So maybe I, I would like to highlight a few ones. Uh, I think definitely, and I saw a question by Maxime in the chat, I think digital transformation is a very important one. And uh, with the leadership of the, of the World Bank, there is actually this new tool. And I think it's been uh, an important uh, an important uh, aspect uh, that countries have been uh, demanding uh, tools on. Uh, and again, with having this broad vision around supporting the, looking at the digital social protection delivery system as a whole and be complemented by, by existing uh, tools such as the payment or the unique ID. I think this uh, is an important one. Maybe to mention three other quick ones, the sustainable financing. I think it's the elephant in the room and all countries are, are working on developing uh, strategies for the sustainable financing of their social protection system um, and really uh, making sure it's fis fiscally sustainable over time. So definitely there is some aspect in Cody, but maybe things we could look into. Um, we've been talking about inclusive social protection and the people we are missing. And I think that the focus on inclusivity um, and ensuring the social protection system are accessible uh, to all, including the, the marginalized groups um, is has been coming up a lot at country level. And again, there may be room for uh, looking a bit more at it in the existing tools or develop potential specific tools to complement. And just finally reiterate what, um, what Ruslan has mentioned uh, earlier around uh, shock uh, adaptive social protection, shock responsive social protection, and especially uh, with uh, the climate change uh, crisis. Maybe I can just very quickly um, uh, add to this, um, both with my opinion and an up update. Um, the, the first challenge is to decide whether you do a standalone tool on many of these issues or whether you mainstream them within the existing tools. And the, in an ideal world, we would have both. Um, so just to inform you that we, um, there is, I mean, as you may have noticed, Cody was the first tool that was developed. It's, uh, it's already been uh, 12 years since the effort started or, or 10 years since the, uh, the tool was then finally launched after the two pilot applications. Um, so we are working on an update and this update specifically looked looks at how to better include um, gender aspects, uh, disability aspects and um, humanitarian crisis aspects uh, into this uh, system assessment. Um, and in addition, we have the disability tool underway for, for disability more specifically. Um, and then we were also thinking of, based on, on the experience with revising the system analysis tool to perhaps have pull out like a few five pager at least or something like that on or issue brief on these specific aspects on gender, on, on humanitarian, etc. There's also, um, in, in terms of future tool development, there's also currently a discussion on whether to um, develop an ISPA tool on um, social protection and climate change. Um, I mean, the primary objective is uh, of social protection systems is to protect people against their individual risks along the life cycle. But increasingly, uh, there is a blurring of the distinction between idiosyncratic risks and covariate risks. Uh, if you become unemployed because of um, a, a larger shock or crisis happening, or if you fall into ill health because of a pandemic, that's no longer an individual risk, but a covariate risk. And these increase with climate change. Um, and so th uh, um, this is an increasingly an increasing concern about how to make social protection systems adaptive and how to prepare them to be uh, robust and resilient uh, in an area of climate crisis rather than climate change um and you may be aware that um just last week we launched uh, the world social protection report at the ILO that also addresses these questions on on um just transition in in uh, and climate action 
And so uh, this is another area where uh, we may want to explore doing an ISPA tool on. Um, I would just like to take this um, opportunity to just very quickly um, as say something on some of the other questions that I answered in the chat. Um, so there's a question around how to track uh, ISPA tool application experiences. And as a secretariat, indeed, we are struggling with this because we are often not informed um, when ISPA tools applications are being carried out. And so we can't document that experience. On the website, we have at least two country reports for each tool because there is normally a requirement to have at least two country applications for a tool to be published. That doesn't mean that there aren't more experiences. It just means that in order to get an idea of what such a country assessment looks like, we think the, the having at least these two examples already is a good starting point. Um, and yeah, I'll not take up too much up too much time. Maybe others want to come in as well. And yes, I mean, just to all participants who are still uh, listening in, um, as Paula put in the chat, you can also just um, let us know if you want to speak and then um, pose your question live. Thank you, Celine and Veronica. And on that question, Florian, would you like to come in? Yeah, just uh, kind of on the question, what, what other areas that might be interesting? I very much agree with Celine um, that I think financing is one that probably need, maybe could be needs to come out. I think that's just really, really relevant. Um, the other thought I had, and I don't know to what extent that maybe might be covered already, but I feel like increasingly in my, certainly in my work on the kind of extension on coverage, um, questions about the integration of non-contributory and contributory social protection and how they come together and what an integrated system looks like um, and how both are needed to kind of close the, the coverage gap in the middle, missing middle. I think that could be an interesting one where we can bring various, obviously we can bring maybe different aspects from various tools together and maybe with some additional thinking. I think that that's certainly something that a lot of governments are thinking about how to close that coverage gaps and what how do, how do we use the various tools that we have. Um, so I think that could be an interesting one. Um, the other thing that I think may be missing is something on care and social services. Um, I don't know to what extent that's included at the moment. It feels all very kind of cash and income heavy, maybe. Um, so maybe there's something about the, the non-cash side of social protection and what, what we can do about that, about different models of implementation and financing. Um, anyway, lots of ideas. Wonderful. Um, hopefully that with the ideas, we also have uh, practitioners or institutions that take the lead in developing. <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> Ruslan, please. Uh, thank you. I completely agree with uh, everyone. And these are actually excellent ideas. It's very nice to keep that going because we need to uh, be aware of where potentially uh, we can grow. Um, I'm, uh, I'm reflecting on the experience of countries I'm currently working on in Africa. And here we have one thing that I believe is, is missing. A lot of these countries are prioritizing universal health coverage as a beginning of building a comprehensive social protection floor. And I believe, um, I know ILO is very much on this subject and it's a lot going on. Veronica organized some really interesting discussions around it, but we probably need a tool because um, we, we struggle to have a good dialogue sometimes with our health colleagues uh, to make sure that we protect the poor and vulnerable in the adequate way. So we need somehow to merge or to branch out to an area which is a border area. For ILO, it was always a core, but for some other agencies, health and social protection are different sectors. So we need to bridge this gap and make sure that all we are as social protection specialists understand the, uh, the nitty gritty of uh, health insurance, especially universal health insurance with a specific focus on the poor and vulnerable and, the, uh, and with all of the aspects, policy, uh, the actual program design and delivery. That would be very useful. Another thing that is also based on my experience is that uh, we, we think about sustainable uh, social protection and helping people to move out of poverty. One of the way of doing it is actually encourage income generation. Encouraging income generation may take different shapes and forms, but in poorer countries, it typically takes a form of promoting small entrepreneurship. Uh, we might think about also documenting and codifying the experience in this area. It's again, an area which is uh, sort of uh, social protection and labor. 
and jobs we 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 are integrating it in our case but in some other cases they also uh, seen us separate and it would be nice to do this uh, tool or to actually explore how what are the good practices of uh, doing inter uh, entrepreneurship support programs um, how we can assess them there are multiplicity of these programs. There is a lot of fragmentation in that particular area as well. And hence, there is a potential opportunity for us to get involved and to make sure this is becoming a really coherent part of the system. Thank you. Thank you very much for that take, Ruslan. Um, do we have anyone else um, that would like to come in on this question? I'm being mindful of time, and we may have to um, move on to Q and A um, shortly after. I, I mean, if I may, if nobody else is yeah. currently asking for the floor, uh, no. I mean, I, this is super interesting suggestions, and I, I uh, very much agree um, that these are the key things to look at. And it's very interesting, also, if we um, look at the original um, uh, suit of ISPA tools. Um, that we had envisaged in the beginning, uh, these are all there. Um, health is there, um, skills and labor market access is there. Um, so this, I mean, economic inclusion or uh, uh, labor market integration that Uslan talked about. Um, uh, I'm, I'm aging is there. So, I mean, I don't know whether care could arguably <laughs> um, be considered as part of that, but care of course is larger than than just uh, long-term care. It's also childcare, um, et cetera. And, and this is very important. Um, why is it that we don't have those tools yet? Um, so um, this is a little bit uh, due to the nature that all the ISPA work is carried out. And that also explains a little bit of the fragmentation. There was COVID and then the firefighting started people didn't have uh time for this uh thorough analysis of um of gaps and and really uh plan long-term policy planning because they really needed um to find quick patches uh i think we're now and, and then of course i mean on top of that we had food, food price crises we had we, we now are in a more difficult fiscal situations and uh, situation in more in most countries and uh, uh um more difficult geopolitical situation. So um, all of this is not necessarily, um, um, in, in that situation, it's not easy to draw attention to social protection system planning, although of course, uh, it means also that social protection system are now more needed than ever. Um, but in a way, I think the the beauty of the ISPA work is that it's uh, really a genuine interagency effort. You can see already on our screen now, there's UNICEF, FAO, World Bank, ILO, but th there are many more agencies involved. And then of course, civil society actors, but um, there are many more agencies involved in this. But we are all doing this within our existing, um, already overstretched workload and, and budget. And that sometimes means we're not always uh, able to develop things as quickly as we would like to. Um, uh, it would be much easier. In the beginning, we had um, received donor financing for the first development of the tools that made it a lot easier to pro progress faster. Um, so that's that's clearly maybe also an indication that uh, one consider consideration could also be, is it worth uh, mobilizing again resources for, for better support of, of ISPA tool development and application? Um, but even without that, I mean, Florian's question on we do we focus more on on cash transfers or um, how do we bring in the services? I think that's that's always a super difficult part. And yes, I mean, we we tend to maybe work more on income security initially because um, in a way that's this is difficult enough in many instances, but it's still much easier um, than health or care or other services where you don't only have to think about how to finance. Uh, and pay this, but there there is the whole question of quality supply of these services that is much more complex than than making a cash payment. But that doesn't mean we should shy away from 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 the difficulties of of also building building up these. And then of course the easy way out is also to say that I mean we need to ensure income security at a level that um, services are that they generate access to these services um, and that they are affordable. But at the same time, they need to be available, and and that's that's a key bottleneck and challenge. I also very much like what Ruslan said about being able to talk to colleagues in the healthcare sector, and that was indeed 
the starting point for the whole ISPATUL initiative also that the observation that there is so much fragmentation across social protection systems that in many in most countries they are uh, social protection schemes and programs are delivered um, across different sectors some responsibility for some of the programs sit with the Ministry of Agriculture or the Ministry of um, Employment and Social Affairs uh, with the Ministry of Children and Family or uh, or Women, etc, uh, etc. Et so, uh, and, and again, I mean, just like this is an interagency collaboration on the development partner side, also at country level, this is a key um, aspect. And that's why also we emphasize so much getting all the stakeholders around the table, developing a national consensus around this, really um, facilitating at country level this national dialogue across different sectors and across different ministries to come together and think about what is the social protection system at national level that we want to build and how do we come in uh, from different areas to to build a coherent um, system that that uh, doesn't duplicate but doesn't leave gaps um, and that uh, all seamlessly works to, to build that social protection floor, as we say, at the ILO, that includes both income security, but also access to healthcare and other needed services. Thank you, Veronica, for that um, kind of actually a broad roundup of, of the discussion as well as our ways forward. And Mariana, please. I was going to add a bit to this discussion, but then I don't know because we have three minutes, so maybe I can also do some final words. I don't know if you want to do the Q&A, how we are going to move on, because we are very close to the end. But I wanted to say <laughs> that I just came back from this training on artificial intelligence on ITCI law in Turin last week. And I think, I mean, there was a lot of discussions around, you know, the application of this kind of intelligence for uh, um, structural, in structural design. So I think, you know, because we are talking about integrating tools or maybe having it specialized for each country or the, 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 the burn uh, the burn or the, the, the cost of, of developing those tools, there might be room for thought on trying to use those technologies to facilitate that work. I mean, at, at least for the tools, we already have the knowledge behind. Maybe it's just a matter of, you know, adjusting and uh, adapting, implementing or something. So I think just, as part of the discussion, just to, to, to highlight that. And then as, I don't know if I should close or you want to go with it, because I mean, as uh, sourceprotection.org and the new host, let's say, for the website of the ISPA tools, we just want to say that we will try to do our best to keep it updated with the, you know, links to the tools or the last information. Uh, this is more for the crowd, you know, uh, that we will make uh, uh, sure that we'll try to uh, make the access to those tools easier. Um, also, that we'll be reaching out to the Secretariat of the ISPA II Secretariat to ask for the, you know, how can we improve this or where is this information? As we keep on doing, we'll we'll try to kind of make this link between the the two. Um, and then uh, this is all on pro or trying to you know improve the knowledge sharing and then the access to information that will you know keep our policymakers more and better informed. So that is just what I wanted to say at the end. Thank you, Mariana. I think what Veronica mentioned and you uh, following up is, is a good sort of closing uh, to this webinar. And unfortunately, that doesn't warrant as much time for more Q&A, but I, I've seen a lot of uh, sort of live discussion on the on the chat function. And this is just, again, an indication that these tools are needed. They're being applied. There's interest in updating them um, and improving them as, as challenges become sort of more interlinked and more more complex and and social protection instruments are are, are at the forefront of a, of a lot of the response efforts uh, going forward. Uh, so I want to thank you all again uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for um, for your time and for your energy. Um, and uh, please uh, stay in touch with us. Stay in touch with the ISPA Secretariat. Uh, please keep us updated on if there's interest in applying the tools, even if it's the first time that you're you're attempting to do so. We can put you in touch with other colleagues and other organizations to to, to, do, to do it jointly. Uh, and please keep us informed on on uh, on the ground what you see as being uh, the need uh, for the ISPA tools. And and also. 
um, if you would like us to have sessions in your organization, sort of to just brief the teams and the colleagues on, on the applications of the tools, we'd be delighted to do so. Um, and please do invite us to peer review. Uh, it's always a great way of us uh, sort of being in touch with what's happening in these countries and also uh, potentially linking uh, uh, applications from one country with another to sort of uh, make it more um, more um, sort of updated and more um, uh, interesting for, for a lot of our practitioners on the ground. Uh, and yes, uh, on the chat function over there, there's there's the website on how, how to be in touch with us. And I, and I want to thank Mariana and the team as well for taking uh, sort of the lead on on uh, on making the ISPA tools more visible uh, via the socialprotection.org platform, which which is very active, very um, you know up to date, and and hopefully this way we can we can uh, keep these tools alive and uh, and improve and um, sort of work together in um, uh, in a cohesive manner. I always say that the ISPA tools are, and I always sort of show off and say that the ISPA tools are one of the most tangible. Uh, uh, things that we have as as a social protection community. It's something that we 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 hold. We see they're there. They they uh, they take time, uh, but they're very uh, they're very useful and they're very um, realistic. They're there. It's not just a collaborate. It's an actual collaboration that we can we can sort of take credit for. And and I'm uh, Veronica and I are very very proud of that. Uh, so thank you again. Um, and uh, you can find the recording of this of this. Um, webinar, as we said, in socialprotection.org. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.